and move on to our final topic of ELE 475, which is directory-based cache coherence. So a little bit of a warm-up here. We remember the three C's of caches. We had compulsory misses, capacity misses, and conflict misses. Well, we're going to think about adding a new miss type here, a coherence miss. So our coherence miss is some other cache or some other entity reaching down into our cache and invalidating something there. So this is strictly different than compulsory capacity and conflict. If anything, it looks the, most, the closest to a compulsory miss because you're effectively, uh, it's, it's like a first miss, but someone, some other entity bumped it out of your cache. Um, but it's, it's, it's not any of those either. So it's this communication that's coming from other cores that is even in a snooping protocol or a symmetric shared memory multiprocessor that other traffic comes in and will actually bump things out of your cache. You need to worry about this. Now, we're going we're gonna to take these coherency misses and put them into two different categories. True sharing, and we, we talked about this briefly at the end of uh, two lectures ago, or three lectures ago, but we're going we're gonna to categorize this as two different categories of misses. True sharing misses, which we're going to say is that if you were to have a cache where each block length or cache line size is exactly, let's say, one byte or the minimal size that you can have on your machine, you would still have that miss. So that's a true miss. And a true miss is if you're actually sharing data. So if one cache, let's say, writes some data, another cache wants to go read, or another processor wants to go read that data and needs to go pull it into its cache, that's a true sharing miss. You need to do that communication. Now, to contrast that, we talked about false sharing, or false sharing misses. And what a false sharing miss is, is saying that if you were to reduce the uh, sharing size or the block size down to, let's say, one byte or one word, <clears throat> and you run the same program, and the miss occurs, or the miss occurs when the block size is, let's say, one versus uh, or, or excuse me, if the miss occurs in the larger block size versus when the block size is one, then that is actually a false sharing miss. The block size was too big and you had two pieces of data in the same cache line that are effectively causing a sharing even though there was no true sharing going on of the data. It just so happened they're packed into the same cache line. <clears throat> now it's a little bit more than that. Um, we're also gonna say false sharing can happen when data gets moved around or gets invalidated, but it's not being, it may be shared later in the program, but that exact miss was not because of data being communicated. So it's a little bit broader um, than what we said last time. It, it, it does still happen because there's two pieces of data packed into the same line, but effectively what, I, what I'm trying to get at here is you can have data sort of bounce around between different caches and the same instruction sequence or the same load and store sequence would not cause the misses if you had a very small uh, cache line size but does happen with a large cache line size. So let's, let's look at an example here and try to categorize these different misses. So let's, let's start off here. The initial conditions are um, X and X2, or X1 and X2, which are two, piece, two words of data are packed into the same cache block or the same cache line. P1 and P2 have both read the data and it's, it's, it's readable in both caches at the beginning of time. Okay, so all of a sudden, we do a write to X1. And we have to, what are we gonna have to do? Well, we're gonna have to invalidate X1 in P2. And this, this is a true miss because the data was in both. We need to pull it out of the one. We need to actually invalidate it because um, this is actual, actual real data. Okay, so next thing we do is P2 goes and executes a read of X2. Well, 
what you may notice here is at the beginning of time, x2 was in the cache of p2, but it got bumped out here. And p1 never went to go write x2. So this is a false sharing miss. This got it exclusive into p1's cache, and this is going to pull it out of that cache and validate it. So we're going to call this a false miss because x1 was irrelevant to p2 for this, for this miss. OK, so now we see another write to x1. Well, p2 didn't actually touch x, x1. So likewise, this is completely false sharing. Now we see a write to x2. Well, we didn't see any communication going on here. So this is also a false sharing miss. Now finally, we have something that's real here. We're going to read x2. Well, we wrote x2 there. We read x2 here. We're actually communicating data. So this is true sharing. And that's OK. But we want to try to minimize these, these false sharing uh, patterns. This is just to warm up some motivate us into directory-based coherence a little bit. OK, so let's, let's motivate this a little bit more. And let's look at something like an online transaction processing workload. So this is a database workload. So it's a multiprocessor database workload. It's using threads. And what we're going to see here is we have, we're going to run the same workload on a four processor system with four different cache sizes. This, this data is uh, taken from a paper from your book. And what you'll notice is as you increase the cache size, our false sharing and our true sharing don't really change. You still need to communicate data, and you're still going to get false sharing just because you make the cache size bigger, it didn't change the block size. You're still going to get the same false sharing patterns. But as you increase the cache size, the instruction misses, the capacity misses, the conflict misses, the, cold, the, the uh, compulsory misses, we call that cold, uh, go down. Because the cache is getting bigger. So non-shared cache lines performing the, the, the <clears throat> number of memory cycles, the amount of time you take memory misses there, is going down. But the rest of this is not changing. Hmm. Well, OK. This is, this is interesting. So the second question comes up is, what happens if we increase the number of cores in our system? So this is a relatively small system here. Let's, let's plot the number of cores here from 1 to 8 with the same workload. And look what happens. So if we, we look at this, something else is invariant here. This is for a fixed cache size. We're going to plot the number of processors down here now. The number of memory cycles per instruction for instruction misses, conflict, capacity misses, cold, uh, uh, compulsory misses doesn't change. Just stays the same because that's basically uniprocessor based. But as you add more cores, you get both more true sharing and more false sharing. Hmm. Well, this is a little scary because our performance is basically going down as we add more cores. So this is only up to eight. What happens if we're you know, way out here at 100 cores? What do we think is going to happen? Well, we're probably going to be dominated. Our performance is going to be dominated by the sharing and the false sharing and these cache misses. Huh. Well, we need to start thinking about that one, figure out how to, how to solve that, and think about scalability of coherence systems. <clears throat>